Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Kintan. I'm a director of product and uh, worldwide program management for Amazon Music. Work out of our uh, San Francisco offices out of SOMA. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. Before we dive deeper, uh, please join me in, in thanking Joe, SC, and the rest of the Manifesto team for a phenomenal event thus far. <laughs> yes. So today, uh, I want to spend, the, I know it's the last talk of the day, I want to spend a few minutes to share my perspectives on product development, particularly from the lens of reducing friction, and we'll, we'll focus the conversation on mobile uh, to go along the theme of the day. We'll talk about friction, what friction is, what are the causes of friction. Uh, we'll use some anecdotal examples, some actual examples from Amazon's portfolio of products, some of the products that I've had a chance to work on, some that I haven't worked, but I've observed as a, as a keen student of, uh, of product development, um, and tie that back to uh, some of the things that have worked for us, ways in which we have anticipated friction in product development and uh, taken a stab at uh, reducing that friction. Uh, hopefully some of them uh, may resonate with you um, and will help inform your product development decisions. As I say always, mileage may vary, uh, don't intend to be preachy, the goal is to share what has worked for us thus far and uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll find that useful. Uh, now before, before we, we dive deeper into the specifics of friction and product development, I want to start with a very personal story. The story is about uh, over 20 years ago, so two decades ago. Uh, I grew up in, in India, so early 90s. My 10th birthday is when I, I actually uh, first interacted with uh, uh, the conscious uh, interaction with friction. So my, I'm sure in the first 10 years of my life, I've probably uh, interacted with friction multiple times, but my first conscious awareness about friction came on my 10th birthday. Now the story goes that I was super excited about cars. Uh, I told my mom and dad that yes, for my 10th birthday, I want that red Lamborghini. Uh, they were, yes, yeah, you get good scores in school, you'll get the red Lamborghini. Eve of my birthday, I'm super excited. I see that box, you know, midnight, and I stay up, midnight. I, un, you know, I open the gift wrap, open the box, and I see this shiny red car. Uh, I can't wait to you know, turn on the remote control, try to get that, uh, get that car to you know, zoom around and so on. And that's when I realized uh, that the car did not have batteries. Uh, I, I couldn't possibly fathom that why, why in the world would toy manufacturers around the world uh, would not include batteries in the car. My 10-year-old self uh, consciously realized that, yes, there's this thing called friction, and if somebody was thoughtful enough at that toy manufacturer or at, at that shop, or even my dad, then I, then I would have had <laughs> the sheer pleasure of, of taking my Lamborghini for a spin. Now, I uh, don't know about you guys, but was I the only one? Have you guys ever experienced this? Uh, not sure. About, oh, okay, so glad to hear I was not alone. Uh, I still give my dad a hard time about that, and uh, we have a good laugh about that. But as, as you understand, you know, the, the incident was, was of sheer joy. You know, I was overjoyous, super delighted uh, about, the, about the fact that I'm getting this car, and that quickly converted into despair, just because... You know, the, I was, the, the, the experienced designers had gone all the way to 99.9% .9 to get the car in my hands, and the last, last 10 basis points is, is where, where, uh, where you know, they, they couldn't follow through, and uh, it converted from delight to disappointment. So you get the idea of what friction is. So friction, physics defines friction as you know, anything any resisting force you know, that resists the motion between two, two moving layers. I think uh, we are, as product builders, uh, friction is essentially anything that comes in the way of, uh, of the user. You know, I, I know Audrey talked about the, the empathy gap and so on. Anything that comes in between the user and her task. Essentially, you know, anything that, that prevents or slows down the user from completing the intended or desired task. Now, uh, as we build a mobile app, uh, there are multiple phases as we talked about uh, acquisitions, awareness, acquisition, activation, retention, uh, bringing the relapsed users back, and so on. So at every stage, when your user goes from an unaware user to, to becoming aware about your product, 
you know, signing up, then the first time user experience, then coming back over and over again, and then you know, sharing, sharing about your product to their friends and creating that feedback loop. Uh, at every stage, when the state of a user changes from one stage to another, there is a friction, and us, it's our responsibility as product builders to, to anticipate that friction. Anticipate it, identify, acknowledge that friction, and do, do our best to avoid that friction. I think as product builders, we owe that to, to all the customers around the world, regardless of you know, what product you're working on. Uh, why reduce friction? I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but as I just said, uh, converts delight into disappointment. And uh, there's so much, building great products is, is hard. There's so much, so, you know, so much effort and, and dedication and hard work goes into that. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't let those wow moments convert into WTF moments. Don't let those you know, moments of delight convert into moments of despair or disappointment. Uh, so it's super important to, uh, to work on friction. Uh, my personal observation on friction, so I've spent uh, uh, quite a few years on making mistakes and attempting to build products. My personal observation on friction is that three, three factors tend to, tend to lead to friction, especially in consumer mobile products. Consumer mobile products, and there are so many, because, um, because remember the, the puppy in, the, uh, in Will's talk, you know, there, there's such a little attention span and so on. So if, if we want to uh, build a product that, that reduces the delta between the user and the intended task, you know, make sure that we avoid any task that is possibly avoidable. Don't let this, forget the need to, use, to have the user or customer do that task. Second is be very aware of context switching and allow allow customers to, uh, to either gracefully switch context or avoid the scenarios when they have to switch context. And lastly, it's very cliched, but the count and complexity of the decisions a customer has to take uh, is directly proportional to the friction uh, in that customer experience. So please be very, uh, no, be, be very, very mindful and thoughtful of how many decisions are you requiring your customer or your user to take and, and avoid, reduce that number as much as possible. Now, in the next few minutes, I want to show some real-life examples. Hopefully, you, you would have used some of those products uh, and, and share some examples as to how we've taken it. So, avoiding avoidable effort. So, this used to be my CD collection. I'm a 90s kid, so, you know, 90s and 2000s, I was big into music. This, this was my actual CD collection. Uh, now, when the iPod came, the mid-2000s and so on, so when the iPod came, the first thing, uh, that I did, all of my friends did, and as, uh, while working on Amazon, I observed that all our, of our customers did was they'll buy a CD or vinyl, and the first thing they'll do is rip it off so that they can put it on their, on their iPod, put it on their MP3 player of choice, so that they can you know, take it with them at the gym or running, etc. So we thought that, you know, that, that happened for a few years, actually two, three, four years. We thought that there is a repeatable and avoidable task almost every customer, a large majority of a customer around the world is doing after purchasing a CD or a vinyl. Why is, so, why is nobody doing anything about it? So we came up with a thing we like to call auto-rip. Smart branding there, because there's nothing, nothing, to, be, uh, nothing to be super, uh, uh, super fancy about it. It's rip the songs automatically. So Every CD you buy on Amazon, uh, every auto-rip eligible CD, I have to say, every auto-rip eligible CD you buy on Amazon or uh, a vinyl you buy on Amazon uh, will automatically rip it off, and on the Amazon Music app, you'll have that CD, the MP3 version of that song for free, even before the CD arrives in mail. We thought, why not take it one step even further? What about all the CDs that you've ever bought on Amazon? What if we could just delight the customers that since 1998 or since 1999, any CD or vinyl you've ever bought on Amazon, what if you could just take those songs and put it for free automatically on your libraries? Uh, so we just did that, call it auto-rip. Customers were thrilled, uh, all sorts of customer feedback that was unanticipated. I can't believe I like Britney Spears. Can't believe uh, I like this actress. I can't believe I like this, this artist. Uh, but customers were super delighted. Automatically, you know, it, it helps in, uh, in designing the mobile experiences. It was available on their mobile phones. It helped us inform the decisions, the recommendations on other uh, music features, such as stations and playlists and so on. So that was order it. We took an effort that we observed customers were doing over and over again. We thought it could be avoided. 
Uh, so we, we just did that. Just removed the entire friction of you know, waiting for the CD to come, rip it out, you know, put it in, in, your, in your computer, or rip it out, uh, then transfer it back to your, to your mobile MP3 player, and then start playing. We just removed the friction. The second piece is about anticipation of context switches. So this is, I want to spend most of the remaining of this talk on this, this topic because I've, uh, I, I think this is, this is very subtle and uh, I think there is, there is a lot to be done in this space uh, across the board. So I'll take examples of uh, very mundane tasks, tasks that people have been doing for the last 50, 60, hundreds of years actually in some cases. The task of reading a book, watching a video or watching a movie, and listening to music. So if you look at uh, watching a video or watching a movie, over the last 50, 60 years uh, since the invention of television, I'd say, not much innovation has happened in the while watching experience. There is lots of innovation in, in selection, in delivering videos to you, you know, increasing the choices customers have, helping customers decide what to watch, etc. And then after they've watched, uh, letting customers easily share what they've watched, give a review, etc. But while watching, not a lot of innovation has happened. Uh, what we observed, I was working on movies and IMDb at the time, uh, which is also part of Amazon. What we observed was that while watching a movie or a TV show, the most common curiosity of a movie watcher or of a video watcher uh, was to find out who's on that screen. Now, while watching a movie, oftentimes you'll find some familiar face and say, where else have I seen this actress? Where else have I seen this actor? Oh, I, uh, I'm watching an animated Disney movie. I, rec I recognize that voice. Who is that? Is that Morgan Freeman? No. Who's, who's in March of the Penguins? Uh, and the curiosity for the customer has to be so strong for them to switch context from watching a movie to bringing out their phone, going to IMDb or Google or Wikipedia, typing in that name and see who's, who's in, who stars, who's the bill of credit, who stars in that movie or who stars in that TV show. So we thought, what if we, 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 allow, we allow the customers to not have switching context? context. So I'll use uh, Game of Thrones because it's April. So while, while watching this, uh, as an example, you know, say, hey, who's this, who's this actress that plays Cersei on the left? I've seen her somewhere, I've seen her somewhere, and this is a real example that I had experienced that, yes, I've seen this actress somewhere. Uh, I'll zoom in. What if we could just tap on the screen, watching it on the phone, tap on the screen, or watching on a TV and you have a second screen, tap on the screen and tell you right there that, hey, this is uh, Lena Headey. So we, uh, we anticipated this, this actual context switching friction and created something we call, we like to call X-ray, uh, which essentially, you know, while watching a movie, you can just tap on the screen, or in a second screen, tap on a button on your remote, and it'll tell you who's on the screen at that time. It's a hard computer science problem to you know, time code actor entrances and exits and so on, uh, but it's a, it's a problem set worth solving. So tapping on Lena Headey, I can actually find out that, yeah, I've probably seen her. She was the queen in movie 300. Yeah, that's where it makes sense. Uh, that's where I know her from, uh, a brief bio, etc. One problem with TV shows, uh, especially Game of Thrones, is that the, the character arcs of these shows is so complex. Like, you know who Tyrion Lannister is, who Peter Dinklage is, but you may not know uh, like, what else he has done in the last, since, since I saw the last episode or since he appeared last. So we also added characters where, you know, to anticipate, okay, you know, rather than asking my wife or somebody else I'm watching with, that, hey, you know, tell me what was, what was the last thing Tyrion Lannister did, we just added the character information right there. So avoid the need, reduce the friction for the customer to switch context from watching movie to going to a third party source and then coming back or getting distracted. And uh, customers are loving it thus far. We are in the fourth year of this feature. They're loving it. Uh, second is music. Again, the most common curiosity for music uh, is, uh, is almost always the lyrics. Uh, so that, uh, rather than going to uh, Lyric Find or uh, going online to uh, Rap Genius or Genius.com, uh, what if you could just tell the lyrics? You, it's a bit blurry here, but you can say I've got to make it a destination, for instance. You can just see the lyrics, uh, go to the Now Playing screen, open up the app, and you'll see the, the lyrics right there. You can, if you like the lyrics, you can quickly jump to the lyrics right there. Uh, and let's talk about reading. Reading itself has not been innovated quite a bit, like the wild reading experience. So what we've uh, done, this is one of my favorite books, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by 
uh, by Ben Horowitz. Uh, while reading this, oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you come across a word or a term, and you try to guess the word. You know? the, the curiosity has to be so strong for you to actually go pull out a dictionary or, you know, go to dictionary.com or so on, or go to Wikipedia. But oftentimes, you kind of, you know, try to, try to guess the context. You read the sentence up before, sentence after, try to guess the context. Instead, so what if we could just uh, highlight the term and automatically tell, I think the screen is cut off, but on the bottom, it's also actually for books, tell, okay, this is what the term means. If it's the it's actual, actual noun or word, then we'll give you a meaning, uh, give you a snippet from Wikipedia, you can dive deeper into this, so understand, okay, no, this is the detailed Wikipedia article on, on this term, you can find out where else is this term appearing. Uh, similarly, you know, Andy Grove, uh, a quick shout out from, uh, from Wikipedia in this case as well. So really, some of these things are not what customers were asking us. You know, for X-ray, for movies, for instance, it's just having a keen eye to observe how are users using existing product, what makes existing products work, what makes IMDb work, how it might work differently, how do consumers you know, uh, watch movies, just observe hundreds of customers and see uh, where are they switching contexts, what are potential points of, of friction, and how could, we, uh, how could we take a first principles approach to try and, uh, try and reduce it or uh, alleviate it. The third one, actually I want to talk about one more thing. Sometimes switching, switching context is just natural and necessary. Uh, as, as, as good product builders, it's up to us to not punish the customers when they, they, they have to switch context. So with books, we see that a lot. Uh, my good friend AJ <laughs> worked on this, so shout out to AJ, uh, who, uh, who's now at Imager. But uh, with books, because it's a long form content, uh, people tend, customers often read a book on their Kindle, they may listen to the book on their Audible, and they often go back and forth between the two. So you know, while running, I'm gonna continue uh, listening to my book, and then when I go back uh, at night uh, at my home in my bedside, I wanna finish off reading a few more pages. So when a customer switches from being an active, you know, out and about on their mobile device to you know, going back to their Kindle or Fire device, you wanna make sure that we don't punish, but instead, we make it very seamless, very frictionless for them to switch context. And that's what we, we've done with Audible and Books here, where um, we call it Whisper Sync for Voice, just allowing customers to switch between listening and reading a book without any context, context switching. The last point, so three, three causes of friction. First is, you no, know, avoidable effort needs to be avoided. Second is um, uh, the anticipation of context switching and not punishing customers when they switch context. The last is just the, the count and complexity of decisions. So keeping decisions very few at a very minimal and, and avoiding, avoiding the decisions if possible. I'm going to use a couple examples here. Uh, very early on in Amazon's uh, life cycle, we introduced a feature just directly uh, built out of customer, customer feedback and demand uh, around remembering what the customers ordered and order history and so on. It becomes more and more relevant today. Uh, this is the Amazon Fresh app. This is Amazon's version of grocery delivery. We also have Prime now, which is... Uh, another, another approach on this, this same concept. Um, and this is actually my Amazon Fresh uh, screenshot, where I know that you know, we order apples, uh, yogurt, milk, bread, etc., over and over again. As you can see, this mountain high yogurt was purchased 12 times in the last three months in my household. So when I open the app, rather than having me search for yogurt, or search for Fuji apples, or search for bread, uh, why not just present with what I, what I typically buy uh, and show, show it in, in order of uh, frequency of purchase or date, etc. so I can quickly go and, without really thinking much, subconsciously make that decision and, and fill up my cart. Uh, second is, hopefully, many of you may have used it. We like to call it one-click. So uh, if you don't have uh, SC's great book, I highly recommend it. Uh, please pre-order it right now. We can take a 15-second pause. You can one-click pre-order it. Uh, uh, but one-click is essentially, the whole idea is to reduce friction between not having, not requiring the customer to enter their billing address and shipping address, and if they have two credit cards on file, then pick which one do you want to use. Instead, just reduce all, frictions to, uh, all friction points to complete the transaction. Uh, we've taken this one step further, uh, 
and we introduced a, a product called Amazon Dash Buttons. It's actually the one year anniversary tomorrow. And this is essentially um, the 100, over 100 buttons like this, where it's a physical version of, I, I like to call it a physical version of one click, where you can preset it to order whatever, and when you press that button, that order comes in. So uh, I have, this is in my house, where and I have it next to the uh, garbage can, so as soon as I know that the, the liners are out, I can just, are about to be out, I can just press the button and they'll come back. So real quick, to summarize again, three, three causes of friction. The way, hopefully, uh, um, you can avoid it is uh, by, by removing the need. Identify what avoidable effort is. Try to avoid anything that you can actually avoid the user to, to do. Second is context switching. Anticipate where the user has to switch context and, and avoid that. And third is be very thoughtful and mindful about the number of decisions, the count and complexity of the decisions the user has to take to complete their task. And, and reduce them, like work, work like crazy to reduce the number of decisions. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna also acknowledge that reducing friction may not always be enough. Reducing friction is, is one, one discipline of product development or product design. Um, it may fall under usability. You know, this, is, uh, this picture is by jo uh, Josh Porter from bocardo.com. Uh, it's, it's a great blog, great uh, product visionary. If you don't know about him, I highly recommend reading it. B-O-K-A-R-D-O dot com. Uh, this is all about uh, reducing friction is about uh, increasing usability, but to increase desirability you know, from a psychological perspective, we need to increase motivation for the customers. So while you focus on reducing friction, you also want to focus on increasing the desirability of the products and so on. And that's where uh, Mobilize comes into picture, where, where S is no mobile formula. You know, we're going to make sure that uh, the products are learning, the body, mind, spirit, um, they're, they're all in sync. And you, you think about these things uh, uh, before you start designing the product and then work backwards from, for optimizing for all three things. Uh, that, that's all I had. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share my, my favorite uh, quote from Jeff, uh, which he told me while we were working on X-ray together, X-ray for movies together, is that, hey, uh, if you reduce friction, uh, make something easy, people do do it over and over again. And uh, we, we have data, <laughs> we know that people, that's very true, we've seen it over and over again. And hopefully some of it may resonate with your journeys of product development. Again, uh, I'm Kintan at Amazon, uh, based out of here, happy to answer any questions if you have. I'm not sure how much time we have, but we take questions afterwards.